And I am back. Hi, guys. Dom Femulauer here, coming to you from where I live in Port Jefferson Village on the North Shore of Long Island. And I'm here in my studio, which I love being in here. I come in here in the course of my teachings. I'm in here, you know, so often that I get a chance to meet all these different students from around the world and have a great, great opportunity of not only doing some private teaching, but some master classes and some clinics, some recordings on my drum kit. So I've got a lot of things that are going on here. But what I enjoy so much is on these Thursdays, every other Thursday, I get a chance to sit down for the Sabian Education Network and talk to a drummer somewhere around the world that has so much to offer, that wants to give to the world their passion and their intensity of learning and sharing about this instrument. And today, I've got this incredible player who I am a huge fan of. I've been to his website, mikemachine.com. We're going to talk more about that later on. But I want you to meet from Langley out in, in Vancouver, the west coast of Canada. Please, everybody, welcome Mr. Mike Machine. Hey. Hi, Dom. <laughs> Mike, how are you? I'm great, buddy. How are you? I am doing fantastic. I love your setup there. I love the intensity <laughs> of the wall of symbols, which reminds me when Sabian has their NAM show exhibit with the wall of Sabian. You, right. are, you are that second wall. Look at this. <laughs> <laughs> I call it mask. Mike's awesome Sabian collection. <laughs> <laughs> M-A-S-C. That works out really well. It sure is a mask. Yeah. That is just great, man. Well, we've got a lot to talk about. And as always, you know, when I when I when I meet players like yourself, I'm always intrigued of your your passion, your dedication. I mean, we've got tons to talk about. But I want to kind of start from the beginning as to what got you involved in drumming. I know you were from the east coast of Canada, from the New Brunswick area. Right. So coming from that part of Canada. What got you started in playing drums and music, and where did it all begin? Yeah, it's one of those fables, you know, it comes from my parents. So both of my parents are and were phenomenal musicians, uh, working musicians. So as my mom toured while pregnant with me, she told me that there was a couple of nights she couldn't sing because I was kicking to the pulse in front of the drummer, which is one of those fables. So before I even came to the world, I was feeling the rhythm and feeling the pulse. And so the journey for me um, with the personal experience, I was two. My parents got me a little Sears drum set, thought it was cute. Like, oh, he likes to hit around with things. He's always hitting pencils. Uh, and I think my dad wanted me to probably be more like him into guitar, but they got me this little Sears kit and I pretty much destroyed it. It didn't take long. And so they would take me to their band practices. And I remember being so gravitated to the drums. So he would probably sit me on his knee with the guitar and I'd be staring at the drums. And they put me on the floor and I would crawl to the drums. So I think I'm hardwired as a drummer and I come with a lot of attributes of a drummer. Um, but yeah, so um, when I was five, my parents got me a real sized, uh, adult sized drum set. And I would say it was from then on that I associated myself as a drummer. Now I have a real drum set. I am a real drummer. And um, yeah, it's, it's definitely a legacy that's been handed down. And my father's father was also a, a great musician. So it's probably in my DNA. So this is totally in your blood. This is for sure. Yeah. This, this, you had, uh, it's almost like you had no choice. You had to get involved in music. Um, yeah, I mean, music is always a choice. But luckily, the world gave me that choice. And I, I think that's one of the things as teachers, we realize that not every student or child gets to nurture the opportunity. But because my parents were musicians, it was always acceptable. Everything about it, how crazy or how calm, you know, the colors, the, the craziness, it was always part of the family. Like, yeah, well, we know lots of drummers and that's how drummers are. And, you know, they introduced me, of course, to a ton of great drummers as well. So um, the support, when, when you want to be something that's really loud and upsetting to everybody around you, it's really important to have close support. And so luckily my parents tolerated a lot. <laughs> well, <laughs> a lot. <laughs> it sounds like they, they tolerated it and they empowered you to do it. So this is a, a, a blessing in its own way. Yeah. What was it like, you know, were you listening to any music at that time when growing up? Was there, were there any bands that were sticking out? You know, yeah, you know, them? again, the, the cool influence from being musical parents, they would play their cool songs. Um, my parents were mostly into 50s, 60s, 70s rock. And, you know, I'm growing up in the 80s, so, you know, they would put on Dire Straits. And I'm like, yeah, this stuff's cool. And then I had a cousin come to the house for a Christmas. I'll remember it clearly. I think I was five, maybe six. And he left his duffel bag open, and I opened it up and saw there was a Cinderella tape and a Faster Pussycat tape and an Iron Maiden tape. And when I saw the cover to Iron Maiden, Number of the Beast, 
fireworks went off. So I stole his tape and he knows I stole that tape. And I took his Iron Maiden tape. We dropped him off at the bus. We got home and I put that tape in and life was changed forever. Nico McBrain, you know, <laughs> and that's it. From there, I was like, that's who I am. That's what I do. You know? <laughs> and so heavy metal, that's where it started. But audible metal, you know, when we perceive, um, you know, let's say cars of today, Teslas are not the cars of yesteryear. Um, heavy metal today is not the heavy metal I grew up with. Heavy metal was audible. You could understand all the chops. You could understand all the lyrics. And so that's the heavy metal that I really loved. I loved storytelling heavy metal. I loved metal that was not always crazy, you know, very operatic at times and emotional. So that's how I grew up with it. And uh, so Metallica, Iron Maiden, Anthrax, Megadeth, those, those, those bands were iconic for me. So you really took in some some not only some serious bands, but but the drummers that you were that you were now relating to were some deep pocket powerful drummers. Yeah, and what was really fortunate was in real time I could go see a drummer practice with my parents, and you know he'd be playing the Elvis chops, Ronnie Tot, and those things, and I thought, yeah, they're pretty good. But in my mind, I'm like, you're not playing the crazy stuff. I know what the crazy stuff mm -hmm. is. So I would get to see, let's say, reality drumming, and then go home to my fantasy drumming and try and try and try and try. Uh, in those in those days, I'm also from a very small town. So even in those days when you had MTV, I didn't have MTV. So, you know, it was really um, a savoring thing where you put on your Iron Maiden tape and you played it and you played it and you played it. And you maybe asked a few people the questions. You hoped they had the answers. And yeah, so I just endured and endured, endured, endured and pictured myself playing it all the time. And yeah, so I would say by the time I was in grade three or grade four of, of elementary, I was already playing Metallica, not trying to play Metallica. I was playing Metallica, and it was kind of a, a neat thing at my age, which now we see all over the internet, child prodigies. Like, wow, have you seen the 11-year-old who could play Four Horsemen? I was the 11-year-old who could play Four Horsemen. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is fantastic. So so at that point now, you're, you're, you're living in New Brunswick. Are you starting to play with different bands? Are you meeting you know, musicians that you can jam um, with? That, that happened to me in my teen years. So again, very isolated. I lived in a very isolated community, one church, one graveyard, two roads, one in, one out. And so I spent a lot of time playing and, and it was like, it was my great escape. You know, I didn't really like every aspect of it. Uh, maybe my personality is a heavy metal person and all these country bumpkins. So I just hid in my house and played drums a lot. So uh, I, I found that joining bands or at least showing cool friends that I could play well was how I made friends. And that's why bands became super important to me. Uh, it was almost like the, the one for sure thing that you might not agree with everything else I do, but if you play a guitar, you're going to love me and vice versa. So yeah, I grew up trying to join a lot of bands in school and I played in a lot of bands and um, yeah, that never, that never stopped. So what what you know with with the different bands that you were playing with and 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 now you're meeting people, what you know we have starting to travel to get out of where you were to start to play in different cities at all. We we have you start yeah to yeah and I'm like I always wanted to travel and I still want to travel of course. Um, but it was one of those things where you know maybe I hadn't been to another city in my province and it was music that took me there, or maybe I hadn't been to another province. So um, when I was in Air Cadets, I became lead snare drummer and that took me to the next province for the first time. So music has always been the ticket to ride. It's always been, no matter what I do in this world, it's, well, how'd you do that, Mike? Music, and how'd you meet that person? Music. So it's always been, you know, that, that ticket's been in my hand and it's never gonna leave. Um, so yeah, I've traveled a lot with music, uh, but in my early years, yeah, I just really tried to make a lot of cool friends and, and impress everybody, you know, whether it was the talent show. Uh, in my high school years, I, I played in grade 10, 11 band in grade 10. And in grade 11, I did 10, 11 band. And then grade 12, I did 10, 11, 12 band. So it was always just my my thing. It's my pride, right? Well, it sounds like you have that that type A personality. Uh, you know, is there, you know, is is being competitive, is that a driving force for you? Um, it's very much hardwired into me. Um, and again, I think that comes with small town oppression, inner boredom. Like I wanted to see the world, you know, I'd open up a hit parader and there's Metallica. Ah, oh, I want to see Metallica or oh, I want to see Guns N' Roses. You're not getting to see Metallica or Guns N' Roses. They're not coming to you and you're not going to them either. So I always felt competitive about that. Like, who have you seen and where did you get that shirt? And how did you get that flag? <gasps> That's crazy. So very competitive in that regard of like just wanting to see the world. Um, and then 
Metallica was one of those bands where it had competition with it, where I'd open up a magazine and Metallica is number one and Megadeth's number two. There was a competition within heavy metal. Uh, I observed that part of it. And then, of course, the comparison of the type. So in the 80s, if you liked hair metal, you were that person. And if you liked the other metal, you were that person. So within the world I was living in, a lot of competition, a lot of comparison. And as you know, in the double bass world, way too much comparison, way too much competition. <laughs> It, it's a, a very, very powerful, you know, uh, important part of the drumming process. Sometimes that being that competitiveness, that can drive you to help you to push yourself to a higher level. Yeah, mostly it's been music that's asked me to get there. Like once I realized, whoa, there's another level. And I thought, oh, there's no way. And then you hear that next person and you hear that next person. And also, I think I'm very lucky that when I first started hearing drumming, it was at a level. And then I saw the next level, and then I got to grow and reach with the with the level changes. You know, as as they like the late '80s came into the '90s heavy metal, and then the later '90s and the 2000s, where now if you're beginning your journey, it's already at the apex. And I hate to say that as like a Debbie Downer, but I believe it's at an apex to now where people are having to change their approach to use compound techniques like push pull or constant release and doubles and things to just try to get to a new place because those places have been really, really um, achieved. Yeah. Well, it's an interesting point, very interesting point. So what? So what, how did you get from New Brunswick area, the east coast of Canada, to the west coast of Canada? How'd that, how'd that well, that's, that's a pretty big fast forward, for sure. So I always felt oppressed in the Maritimes. Um, you know, luckily we had Sabian as like a, a parental value. You know, if you're a musician, well, do you know Sabian's from New Brunswick? Like, yeah, all right, Sabian's yeah. from New Brunswick too. So luckily they kind of nodded the value. But outside of that, I never really felt like I was going to be valued properly, that even my parents didn't break out of the bar circuit. And even the biggest names, like, did you know so-and-so plays with so-and-so? They live two houses down and they don't do much. So it really wasn't an environment where I felt like I was going to get what I wanted from music. And so there was an oppression. And so now, in hindsight, I look at it like breaking out of Alcatraz. I did everything I could and everything I had to do to leave that, to find new opportunities, meet those upper level thinkers, you know, like being from New Brunswick, next door is Quebec. So if you're into heavy metal, Quebec is Mecca. And I always wonder, well, how do they get so great? I play drums every day. I'm nothing like this guy. I'm nothing like that guy or a girl. Like what, there's a girl who's better than me? So in Quebec, they have the product of environment where all the greatest bands in the world go there. All the greatest schools are there. So there's just a great environment to become great. And I didn't have that, so I wanted to go there. And so that explains the journey, whether it's from New Brunswick to Ontario or to Alberta to BC. And so I'm always trying to smother myself in greatness. Um, you know, if I had a chance to live half an hour within you, Dom, I would. <laughs> you know, it's, it's all about absorbing and just being in that place where I walk into a random music store and there's Dom Familero. Whoa. <laughs> Right, that's a moment for me. That's uh oh, here it comes. I'm gonna cannonball this guy, and I didn't have that in New Brunswick. I I yeah. barely ran into anybody who I thought was whoa until I went to the Sabian factory and I walked by yeah. the office one day and there's Neil Peart sitting in an office and it was just like, <sighs> yeah, <laughs> pretty powerful. Yeah, it was intense. It was very it, like it was like earlier too. It wasn't it wasn't when I was feeling numb by fame. You know, it wasn't like oh, there's Dom. Oh. There's so and so of any colleague or whoever. It was, oh my God, Neil Peart is ten feet away, and you have to act like it doesn't matter. <laughs> 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 yeah, over here on the wall, which I'm, hopefully I can see, show you guys, I have the big banner of Neil front and center. When you come into my studio, there he is. That's the all Canadian hero, in my opinion. Well, he really, he really was, and still continues to be a, a hero. Uh, although he's from Canada, he is. A hero to the world when it comes to drumming. I mean, he really, at all that he had, you know, performed and lyrics and just philosophy, he really reached millions of people and continues to reach them, even though he's no longer with us. So the fact that you had a chance to to meet him at that point is pretty powerful. So you know, he was in the office with Mark, and you know, you, you don't, you know, but I saw him, and that was it. It was just like now I realize these giant men in my life really are real. He's right there, you know, accessible. So it was the Sabian factory that really cracked the case, you know. <laughs> well, that, the Sabian factory is really an incredible place at many levels. To go there and be a part of the creative process of just the 
insanity of how they make these phenomenal products. And just the people that come in there from around the world, whether it's Weckl or Dijonette or Billy Cobham or Neil Peart, as it was, I mean, it just brings them in and bring it on. And it's pretty powerful on who you yeah. can there. You know, we call it the mother mothership as a nickname, but it's a really neat environment because you have the artists who are definitely big eared. You know, Mark Love, I think, has to have the biggest ears of anyone I've met and mm -hmm. um, the palette that man must have. Uh, but then also there's the men who are as thick as you are wide who are shoveling the metal, you know? So it's a really neat environment of like, oh, what'd you do this weekend? Oh, I was bow hunting. And the other guy, what'd you do this weekend? Oh, I was playing at the symphony. Like there's there's this cool up and down at the factory itself. So when you do the whole touring, you get to see that Sabian is not just artisans and it's not just dudes with hammers. There's this spectrum. So it's a it's a really great place. And anybody who gets the chance to go there, I don't think comes out of there the same. It's basically Willy Wonka's factory. And <laughs> really Willy Wonka. You know? <laughs> so <laughs> it's, it's not chalk and it's metal. I get it. I understand yeah. totally well. So what so where was the first move? You, you moved from New Brunswick was it to Ontario? Uh, well, I toured into Ontario, um, so I was in a native band for about eight years, and we were touring, and I got to see a lot of Ontario. So yeah, I, I first moved into all these little cities around New Brunswick. So first I moved to Fredericton, and then I moved to Bathurst, and then I moved to Moncton, and I did Moncton for quite a while. But within living there, I was always traveling to other spots and um, staying on French couch, friends' couches for a week or two just to see if I'd like that city. And of course, the competitive nature, I was always headhunting the five names of that city so even in bc when i came here there was the top five or ten drummers that i have to meet and i have to see you play so i was doing a lot of that at the time uh just traveling to that city to see who's the giant who's the guy who can play tom sawyer i want to see him so if i had that chance i took it uh and then from there the the actual moving permanently outside of the east coast was to alberta where i spent almost three years there um learning country music and more, I want to say more um, working man's music at that point. And um, it was really great. I loved Alberta as well, but felt a lot like New Brunswick in, in its entirety. It's, it's a very uh, country place and small town and big farm fields and such. So I feel, felt like I got what I needed from there and decided I'm not going to get what I want from there further. So then I came to BC and I love BC. I mean, BC is great. So what was it like from, from West Coast to East Coast, when you finally got to BC, what was it like to experience? Was there a culture difference? Was there a, a type of personality difference? Was it? Yeah, so um, I'm, I'm like a, a coiled spring who's starving. Yeah. I'm always, oh my God, there's so-and-so, or you played with, wait, wait a minute. Okay, let's back it up. You casually just said you played with that band. So I'll give you an example. I was uh, at the music store and I won't, I won't drop the band name in case, but I'm standing there waiting to be served, and a guy comes up and says, hey, I got this call yesterday. This old 80s band wants me to do a gig. I don't even have drums. I said I'd do it. Can I get something from your rental department? And the guy's like, yeah, sure. Uh, who's the band? And he says the name of the band. And my mind goes, boom. <laughs> like, what? You're going to go play a gig with that band, and you don't even care? You don't <laughs> even have drums, and you're getting the gig? And that, I think, is an overall impression of how much opportunity has come to BC, comes out of BC, and people who live in BC are not excited by it. And I'm pretty sure it's the same in New York, it's the same in LA. So uh, I, I think it's weird to observe just because I'm not wired that way. That, you know, when um, Don Famulera comes to town, that there isn't tons of Beatlemania. And I'm like, what? Don Famulera was in town? Oh my God! Right? And I seem to be the only one. Everyone's like, yeah, I saw him over at Starbucks. It was fine. I'm just not that way, you know. Boy, that's that's fantastic that you have that level of enthusiasm, Mike. It really is great. And you know, we, we I I love the name Mike Machine. How did that come about? Ignorance. So uh, I didn't give it to myself. Everybody thinks I did. However, you know, to take a name like that and move forward with it and continue to move forward with it. Um, I grew up in the 80s. Nicknames were awesome. Ozzy Osbourne, Paul Kogan, you know what I mean? The Ultimate Warrior. These guys didn't use the real name. It wasn't John Osborne. It was Ozzy Osbourne. So I always thought nicknames were cool. And I always give people nicknames. If, if you become closer with me, I'll give you a nickname. It's what I do. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I thought nicknames in general were fine. But um, anyway, I ended up doing a studio recording with this native band I mentioned. 
And you know, it was booked for, I think, three day session. And I went in, Dom, and we set up the drums, which were like these weird burnt slingerlins. They'd been through a fire. I was like, oh, okay, I'll play on this kit. Why not? I didn't change anything. I didn't bring anything. I just played what they had. And so he's, he says, you ever played with a click before? And I go, no, what's that? He goes, oh, it's this little sound you're going to hear. It's going to keep you on track with the song. And I was like, okay, put it on. So long story short, I cut the eight songs in one day. And I didn't know that was good. I knew those songs. Of course I know those songs. So you're going to say record. I'm going to play the song. And one take. Oh, that was really great. You want to do the next one? Sure, let's do that. So I cut these eight songs in a session. And he comes up to me after and goes, yeah, your name shouldn't be Mike Malay. Your name should be Mike Machine because you're a drum machine. I go, ah, oh, thanks. That's so cool. That's a cool nickname. And he goes, yeah, because you didn't do any punch-ins. So uh, not knowing how studios work, I go, well, I'd never punch your drums. Why would I do that? And he just starts hysterically laughing at me. And he goes, you don't know what a punch-in is? And I go, no. And he goes, you don't know that all your favorite drummers can't play that well? And I go, what are you talking about? All my favorite drummers are phenomenal. I have no idea that you can piece together recordings. I have no idea of that. And he goes, yeah. So most of the people who come in here, they do like 10 attempts at it. And we have to cut them together and make this great picture. You just did all your songs in one shot straight through. So you should probably have the nickname Mike Machine. And so I knew I could use that name. And it was cool. It was like, ha, ha, ha. I want to be Mike Machine. Yeah. And life gave me the opportunity of world's fastest drummer. And it was pretty much, this is your chance to make the choice. What is your name? And what do you represent? I'm Mike Machine, and it went from there. Well, I think it's fantastic that you are using that kind of a nickname. We always got nicknames as we were younger, and and Morello and Chapin and all these great, great uh, Buddy Rich, they all kind of gave us all nicknames. It's kind of funny how they just kind of like... Did they all give you individual nicknames, Dom? Or did you yeah, they, they, they all were just kind of like, you know, whatever you, whatever you, you know, Buddy used to call me the chauffeur, and he called <laughs> the chauffeur because every time I'd go to see him backstage, I'd be with a different drummer. I'd, I'd go pick up Max Roach and drive him to a backstage to a Buddy Rich concert. I'd go pick up someone like Jim Chapin or, or Joe Morello and bring them backstage. So <laughs> my Buddy Rich said, you, you know all these guys. What are you, a chauffeur? <laughs> so he called me the drumming chauffeur. So it was it, we, all these different, you know, insanity stories. But that's fantastic. That's Mike awesome. Machine fits well. Tell me about the comparison between, you know, large kits and small kits. Okay, so, I mean... I do understand if you have a time constraint, like let me give you an example, I'll teach my eight hour day and I have an hour to get to that venue, set up those drums, sound check with the band, go upstairs and maybe change the clothes and start the show. So under those constraints, you're not hauling this. And I understand that, not unless you're you know, like Hal Blaine and you have a dude who's setting that up before you get there. Um, and since I don't, I'm, I'm a lover of smaller kits in its context, however, why drummers don't look at drums like a piano, I'll never understand. Yes, there are many keys and notes behind me. If the drums are white keys and the cymbals are black keys, why do you think you must hit the whole piano every run through that you play? Why can't you just have the musical dexterity to hit the ones that you chose? Or try some ideas as you go. So for me, I really do prefer to have them at least on hand and physically within reach if I think that it's going to suit the music better rather than I only play four drums, I only use two cymbals. For me, that's a very um, uh, limiting. It's, it's, not, it's not lazy, it's just limiting. And that doesn't mean you can't do a ton. We know there's, you know, we can sit forever through stick control. In my pile of 200 books, I have 10 copies of syncopation and I change the format every time and there's only two sources. So I do agree that you can do a plethora of, you know, different combinations. However, maybe it's the ADHD in, my, in me or something, but I just really love to have many snares, many hi-hats, many rides, many, many, many. Um, yeah, like, like an artist with crayons. It's just a lot of crayons, but you don't use them all at once. And you don't use them every painting. You just, every once in a while, oh yeah, I forgot I had fuchsia. Fuchsia was cool, right? So... That's how I feel about it. And also, if we could get into the the approach to one drum. Yeah. I really don't like that people look at one drum as one sound. You know, if I watch the hi-hat solo from somebody really cool, you get <laughs> a lot more sounds than three. You know, there's a lot of tuning and 
feeling and using and elbows and slides and reverse and you know there's just so much to approach to one drum so i i wouldn't suggest if you don't understand the mechanics of drums and cymbals to get a bunch of them but i think once you do understand that one drum can be 10 sounds it's fun to have 20 it's fun to have 30 right and the combinations of well, I think I think what you do so well, Mike, which I'm impressed with, is that whether it's with a drum or whether it's with a cymbal, you know how to pull sounds out of it. It's almost as if you're you're tuning this the, the drum, or you're tuning the cymbal with how you hit it, with the technique that you use, with the stick that you're using. You really pull a, a wide variety of unique sounds out of that kit. Uh, that's also a curse. The blessing is a curse that I hear those things. Uh, a lot, you know, so in my own playing, um, I'm a real stickler, pun intended. So I could do a whole take of a song seven minutes, listen back and go, you know what, maybe I should have used a nylon tip and I'll do it again. And you know what, maybe I should have used a root stick and I'll do it again. Or maybe not a lot of people are that persistent where they're like, I'm going to do it all again, just because it could be better. I will do the Da Vinci over and over and over and over until it's just where my brain is right. Or I end up at the end of it and it's the Michael Jackson story where the third take was the best. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so talk about, talk about uh, as an educator, I'm so impressed that you have kind of gone from, from playing over 3000 gigs and what you've done. I mean, this is incredible that you have performed with so many different bands and traveling literally from, from you know, coast to coast in Canada. But then you get involved in the educational part of it. You got involved with teaching, and that seems to be a, an evolution that is growing more and more with you. Right. Um, I think I just empathize with anyone's torment. Um, you know, I'm, I'm just turned 42 in November, November 23rd, I turned 42, and I'm now embarked on this journey for 40 years. 40 years of pretty much every day thinking about drums. And when somebody comes to me and says, this is where I am, and I'm not happy, I instantly run to them with that warm blanket attitude of, it's gonna be okay, we're gonna get you out of here, don't worry, you just gotta move this bush. You see the trail now? Oh, I never, yeah, it took me 10 years to move that bush. I didn't realize there was a bush either. Almost like those pictures where you're looking and they go, do you see it? And you're like, I don't see nothing. And eventually the elephant jumps out. Oh, that takes so much time. And for some people, even with 40 years invested, you don't you don't notice the bush. So for me, it's a relieving system. Uh, I do want to see your systems and I do want to see your perspective of that Rubik's cube known as drumming, that if I'm seeing red and yellow and you're seeing blue and green, okay, I get you. So I'll turn mine to blue and green and we'll go from there. But it's mostly empathy that if somebody says, Mike, I'm struggling. I've been really struggling for a long time. Instantly, there's a place in my heart, whatever you need. Let's, let's get you out of there and do my best to fast forward that torment because I, th I think you, after you know <clears throat> X amount of years, you understand that it's not fun to feel tormented for a year. Yeah. You know, we do we do tell people to accept it for an, for a month. Like, hey, this is going to take a month, and you do twenty times each each exercise, you'll get through it. But when you see them struggling for a year, it's just not a cool existence. So I really try to just free people of that stasis of like I'm stuck, and if you're not stuck, then you're moving, and as long as you're moving. Don't suck. That's my rule. If you're moving forward, don't suck. Embrace the pace. And that's it. So that could be a 50 BPM challenge. That could be a 250 BPM challenge. It's if you're moving forward, what's wrong? Right? That, that's probably my, my theory of teaching. Boy, that's great. But what, what, what do you see with, with, the, with the, the students that are coming up now? Do you see, you know, do they understand some of the history of what came before them? Do they understand who the Neil Peart's word? Do they understand you know, a name like Buddy Rich? Do they do they have the same kind of, do you see them having the same kind of drive that you had, for example, when you were young? Um, well, what I love about having this opportunity with you, Dom, is you come from a time when there were less options to musicians. There was halls and dances and theaters and musicians. There wasn't also record players and also DJs, and also computers, right? That, that era is probably, probably the truest music has ever been because you could produce music and reflect on it and create together in a studio, but also it was real and really valued, that people really valued musicians. And then I grew up in an era with, it was like the old guard of, hey, you should drive your bike to the library and learn it, versus the, well, you can go on the internet too. So I was kind of stuck in the middle. 
Um, and I appreciate that about you and your guard, you know, that without you guys to still bridge this gap, do we really understand what it's like to carry all of your trap, trap kit onto the New York subway system? How many people really understand that these days? Very few. The buskers, you know what I mean? They understand. Um, but now I'm now the bridge. That now when a student comes to me and says, I want to learn this song, the chances of it being a real drummer to look forward to or look up to is very slim. You know, we have maybe 21 pilots. Who's Josh Dunn? You don't even know the guy's name? What? What? You didn't look it up? You have the internet, the vastness of the internet, and you didn't even look up his name? Where I was like record with the magnifying glass trying to see like who <laughs> drums does he use? You know? So I'm, I'm now a bridge where I try to, okay, kid, I get it. That song is not a real drummer. I know you thought it was. It's not a real drummer, but now it's going to be. So we have this cool app out there right now called Moises, and I use it religiously. I remove the computer drummer. We put in the real drummer. And so through that bridging, I try to expose them to this is the way an acoustic drum set demands. This is the way an electric kit demands. And this is your place within it. So I think all the people who come within you know, an hour of me definitely are going to get it. But overall, no, I think I think a lot of this new students don't understand that they're trying to be like somebody because they're, there's Mac Hine. That's that's the new drummer. Mac Hine is the new drummer all across the board. Oh, you like the new Bruno Mars tune? Yeah, his brother's the drummer. Is his brother the drummer on the album? Not so convinced, right? Just the way music is produced these days, it's just not... It's not a real drummer. It's not John Bonham. You know, it's not Mitch Mitchell. It's not Lars Ulrich. And people are like, oh, he's making mistakes. That's the real guy, right? So that's that's where I think the, the changing of the guard is. And I am a bridge, the way you are a bridge. And hopefully, I will bridge enough people that they can bridge, and that we'll never lose this. You know, just if you thought back to like, what did the colonial drummer think of what would happen? We still talk about them, yeah. and we still use their perspective. So hopefully. Hopefully when they show up and they see the blistered hands and, you know, the everyday attitude that they will carry that torch. As they did when they when they carried these kind of drums that I have right back here. This is a, an old Mola drum. And yeah. uh, when they carry these drums and marched uh, as, in America during the Revolutionary War, and the Civil War, all these different wars, they marched not knowing that they would even survive that day. Yeah, no, I, and I, I do teach the colonial attitude, and I too was in cadets, and you know, uh, it's funny how your ego can really bite you sometimes. Careful what you wish for. One of the stories with cadets was they had all these Ludwig parade drums, and I looked over, and there was this one 12 lug, one bar lug snare, and I'm like, that's the one. And they're like, oh, that's for the lead snare drummer. If you be the lead snare drummer, you get that drum. I was like, oh yeah, competition time. Here we go. Who wants to cut heads? I got you all. Well, I pick up that drum, and it weighs three, four times what the other drums do. <laughs> so careful what you wish for. I become the lead snare drummer and I have to march miles and miles with this like 40, 50 pound, 12 lug, crazy marching drum. And everybody else has the super light eight lug dinky one, you know? So it's one of those uh, careful what you wish for scenarios because some of those marching drums were crazy heavy and some of them weren't. So nowadays you have these big shoulder harnesses and they're strapped yeah. in and doop -a -doop -a -doop. not me. I had, I came home and my mom can attest to that. Give her the old Carol Burnett. Uh, <laughs> um, basically um, I came home with big bruises on my thigh from that drum bouncing off the sling onto my leg for hours and hours and hours. And that was just part of the, part of the ego, you know? So if you had the bruise, you were lead snare drummer. You know? <laughs> how, how, how intense when you think about it, you know, you mentioned your mom and, and, uh, and uh, you know, with a, with a name like Malay, your name Mike Malay, you had mentioned about you know your dad too, and uh, it uh, it uh, seems like it's a about a year that you've lost your dad, right? Tomorrow, tomorrow marks a year. So you know it's funny, Dom. It was uh, exactly September twentieth that I reached out to you guys and said, hey, I would be interested in doing a, a Send Network interview. It'd be great. I use the Send system. I even have it laminated here so I can use the pages with my students. And um, comes up that you guys have the opportunity to do it with me and. Honestly, I would say you saved me from a potential funk because, you know, one year of the day, it's like, oh, wow, it's heavy again. And not that it's not always, but it's it's ex extra heavy. And now you've kind of released me into this uplifting look forward to, you know, day before you get to talk about him with Dom. You know, you know, it's funny, Dom, like, I don't know, to have a nickname like Mike Machine, it's almost risky because you can't be arrogant. 
Uh, but Dom, you are probably one of the best drummers out there and you're one of the kindest guys. And when I grow up, if that ever happens, I want to be like Dom. So it's a huge opportunity and I want to thank you. I want to thank Joe. I want to thank Sabian. I want to thank Chris Danke and Andy Dilgen and, and just everybody who's given me this opportunity to, to come and be happy. You know, just, that's what this does. This makes My happy. I, I thank you. And just so you know, when I grow up, I want to be like Mike Machine. So just so you know, <laughs> that's kind of how this process works. I want you to talk about, about Sabian. You've got an array back there that is absolutely incredible. And, uh, you know, it's just it's just an incredible setup that when a student comes to your studio, they, they their eyes must just light up and they must be blown away by just the setup that you have. But I want you to talk about your relationship with Sabian, and then I want to get into some of the symbols that you have back there. Okay. Um, so, yeah, luckily, Sabian's homegrown for me. Um, you know, I started playing drums in 1981, and Sabian was forged in 1981. So, you know, it's always been a cool brand. Um and a value system. So again, you know, they used to do these cool, like they would have jean jackets with the big Sabian crest and they would have leather jackets with the Sabian crest, maybe just a little one. But when you'd walk into a convenience store and there was a man you didn't know with a Sabian jacket, he was instantly your new friend. Like, hey man, you got a Sabian jacket? Oh, you play Sabian? So cool. So, you know, it's very homegrown for me. And I did meet a lot of friends through the, the Sabian brand. And, um, yeah, so in the schools, let me just show you some of the treasures that I have here. So right here in front of me, um, obviously I do have a lot of Sabians. I sit usually between 150 and 200 at any time in my life because I just love them. And so this is one of the originals. This is, uh, it's a Zilco by Asco. And it's one of the first ones from the early 80s. And it sounds phenomenal. So I have that as like, just to remember where Sabian started. There's no hammering on that. It's just a produced laid symbol. And then from there, when I was in school, the envy of all drummers was the B20. Now, if you could afford the B20, ooh, you were doing really well in life because there's the B8, there was the B8 in Germany with the green label, and the B8 in Canada with the red label, but you also had the black label B20s. So I have a few of these. I get them where I can. So. I got a long history of like envy with Sabian, like, oh, I want the AAs. And, you know, the, it used to be Sabian only went up to HH. So, you know, to get a hand hammered, it was big money and it was always the best sound, you know, regardless, you know, I had, my parents always had drummers. They're like, oh, here's a Zildjian from 63. Mm, I don't think I like it as much as that hand hammered I just heard. It was really nice. So Sabian was always this innovation, which it represents the split of Robert Zildjian from, say, from them to make Sabian was also innovation. But I would say Sabian continues to provide that next step of the ladder. That if symbols are gonna go somewhere, like you know, topics of double bass and stuff, but if symbols are gonna go somewhere, you can guarantee Sabian is going to get there. Maybe not right away. Maybe another company's trying to do something. Sabian's gonna get there and surpass. So I've seen that my whole life. I've seen it from the AA line. I've seen it to the HH line and then the HHX line. And now, of course, the new AAX, it did it again. You know, the new AAX are so phenomenal. The innovation, does it just doesn't make sense that you can get such a great symbol for that money. Um, and then, of course, the HHX line with new complex, which is what I'd like to run a lot of, the new complex. I can't, I can't imagine a better symbol. So what's funny, my relationship with Sabian now is I feel like they've apexed my own demand, which is crazy. I'm usually a guy who always has something left to say. They plug the boat with that line, that HHX complex, I think is the best symbols I've ever played, ever had. So I, I adore Sabian and continue to adore them. Boy, you have this incredible relationship with them, but I mean, you really understand what I'm impressed with is the history of Sabian going back to Bob Zildjian and, and Willie. I mean, uh, they, you, know, you, you met with them and you hung out with them. Look at this, even this photo here. Bring that photo a little closer to the camera there so people can see it. This is a picture of Mike with with yeah. Bob Zildjian and, and Willie. And uh, I mean, you know, oh, really? Bob was such an incredible visionary at what he did. And the fact that you had the chance to be go to the factory and sit down with them and meet them and hang with them and talk to them really is a, a really special memory. Yeah, I mentioned a couple of treasures earlier. So the thing is, like, when you know Bob, so, you know, when, when it – when it happened that he passed, I really felt my own personal loss, but I also felt the loss for Sabian, and I felt it for the three children, and of course all the grandkids, because Bob was 
I don't know. Bob was real. You know, I think it's it's hard sometimes to find somebody who's projecting a, an intention like a product or a company that they don't have a facade, you know, that there's the person you get to meet and then there's the person that everybody wants to meet. Um, I think Bob was real at all costs to everyone he met. And that really left a big impression with me. And he invited me to sit at his head table in a dealer meeting that I went to. And um, these are some of the dinner placements. So when we sat at the tables, they had them set up really nice like this on the centerpieces of the tables. And so, you know, I'm talking and we're hearing the stories and we're talking back and forth. And, you know, I'm awestruck. I'm like, this is, this is Robert Silgen. This is crazy. But I started noticing that these aren't B8s. <laughs> but I'm like, wait a minute. I think these are AAX splashes sitting on the table. So <laughs> I say to Bob, I go, Bob, are those AAX splashes? And he goes, I don't know. And I go, well, you can tell it's got the hammer pattern on it. And he goes, yeah, they're probably pretty nice. So I pick one up and tap it with my fork. And I go, yeah, they're, they're nice. He goes, ah, oh, cool. And I, I put them back and he goes, and when we're done, if you want them, you can take them. And I go, oh. so <laughs> at the end, I'm looking around, you know, like, all right, here's my chance. And I take the first two. And I'm telling you, Dom, the sound in the room was like hungry, hungry hippos. Every table. <laughs> it was like every drummer that was there, like, oh, wait a minute, we get to keep these. <laughs> and and Bob had the biggest laugh, and he's looking at me like, you see what you did? <laughs> so that was, that was a great moment. But, yeah, if you look here, this one is signed by Bob Zildjian. It's also signed by uh, Mark Love and Willie. You know, that's got to be a rare. Oh, I don't know if you can see that. That's got to be a rare autograph. Willie Zildjian. Beautiful. Right, right Beautiful. There. Yeah, so I just got, you know, the whole gang is on this symbol, and they're treasures for me, and they will always be with me no matter how much traveling I do, because um, I'm a crazy traveler. I will I will stick a thumb out with a backpack and go, but these treasures, they come with me. Well, it really, is it really is great that you know that much. Now, just talk about the symbols. Let's go down the line of symbols that you have back there. Just, just <sighs> do it individually, you know, point to it and talk about it and, and why you chose it and, and just kind of go around the whole Scope yeah. to have it. This is like one of the comments that you know. First of all, you've got you've got people from all around the world that are listening. So you've got Artem McCor from from Moscow. You've got John Gill from upstate New York, another phenomenal player and teacher. We're going to have him on the show here soon. Uh, yeah. Jose Luis Gonzalez is here. Oh, this is incredible. We've got Claude Hoffman from a uh, oh my gosh from Belgium. We've got Bruno Muse from Belgium. We've got nice. uh, Nina Para from Brazil. We've got. Wow. This, this, we, we've got people from all around the world, Mike, that have joined us on here. So thank you all from Cancun, Mexico. We've got to get this, this here. I get nice. it here as I go down the list and see everybody here. Thanks you all, all for joining us. Go down the symbols and just kind of share us with what you have there. Nice. Well, I'd also like to thank everybody for tuning in. And of course, the support leading up to this interview was so heartfelt. Thank you so much. Okay, guys. So what I did is I made a cool display wall in the back. So we could talk about those in general. Over there, I have an Evolution ride. Uh, so a 20-inch Evolution ride, 15-inch prototype, 22-inch Roctagon. That's a rare guy. Uh, then a complex ride. A 23-inch prototype is top dead center. That's a really neat ride. Underneath that is an AAX Rob Bell dry ride. Amazing ride. Um, and then I have a 20-inch Fierce, Jojo Mayer. Uh, I have a 19-inch Volt China, a uh, 20-inch medium complex, HHX a vault lunar ride, which is a rare one. And then over there, a radia 20 inch in the corner. So that's all the displaying that I made for today. But then on the monster kit here at the drum gin, I'm using a 19 inch uh, HHX Holy China, yeah, vault series actually. Um, what I like about the Holy Chinas more than other series, I really like Paragon Chinas, but these are really bendable. They're really malleable. So when I lay into it, it moves with me and comes back out like a whoosh, whoosh. And of course the holes really control the decay. Uh, I'm really not a fan of too much length and sustain on most things, especially drums, very short. So I really like the decay on that series and the sound is great. And then over here I have uh, a clock to gone, which was a display piece, but it sounds great in a stack with a radia. This is a radia 14 with a Sabian ice bell. And then I have the 19 inch HHX Thin Complex Crash. Beautiful. I can't imagine better. It's crazy. They checkmated me. And then here I got the AAX Aero Splash. Again, air vented for the decay. Uh, 22 inch Paragon on the kit right now. Uh, I've been recording a lot of heavier songs lately, so I really need the cut and the ping of the tonality. Underneath this, I have uh, 12 inch Radia hats. I don't know if you can see those. 12 inch Radia hats, 15 inch HHX Complex. 
Then over here, I'm using a HHX Complex Thin 17 with a 10-inch complex splash. Uh, these are a signature gadget called the Mic Machine, uh, sorry, SS Machine. It's the Mic Machine Sweet Stacker by Sweet Spot. It allows me to stack splashes on top of crashes and independently tighten them. So I can have a nice loose crash with a loose splash or a tight versus like I can do individual, which is kind of rare. Uh, and then behind me here, a couple stacks. Uh, Holy China with a Glen, uh, Evelyn Glennie signature. Holy China with a Glennie's garbage signature. Uh, 10 inch HHX complex splash over a 16. Uh, sometimes I swap that out for a 17 as well. This stack is interesting. It's a radius 16 over an 18 roctagon. This thing is low and dry. Really great. And then I'm using a uh, hand hammered bottom fusion hat. Uh, so I like to use that as a secondary ride or an accent. And then the two sets of hats in this corner are 14 inch HHX complex and 12 inch AA mini hats. So on the kit, I have four sets of high hats, four stacks, two rides, three crashes and three splashes and one bell. <laughs> and that's the tour, current tour anyway, it changes a lot. So the, the, the drum set that they have to your left. This side? On the, on the other side. This side. Yeah, just turn, turn the camera a little bit. Sure. We can see a little, I want them to really kind of capture all that you have. I mean, you really have a unique setup. So do yeah, you- I got Bob's cowbell here, the Alex Acuna signature. Nice. Do your students get a chance to, to play this kid? Yeah, so there's businesses in this building next to me. So after 5 p.m., students get to come and they get to play on the big kit. I also have another set hiding in this corner. I don't know if you can see that, guys, but there's a basic kit here for, you know, the not so intimidating. Right, you don't want students to feel intimidated by the gigantic kit always, but um, they do get to use it. And what I do is I make special bookings for the students that are in the daytime. If they're a daytime student, that's you know, oh, but I want to play the real drums. Okay, so Saturday at six o'clock, you get to come and play the real drums. So I do that, and I, they all get the opportunity, you know. And again, it's all I didn't have it. I didn't have the best gear. I didn't have the best opportunities. I definitely didn't have a place like the drum gin, and I didn't have a guy like Mike Machine. So yeah, anybody who comes under Team Machine, as I call it, uh, totally gets to experience all of it. And there's nothing off limits to them. Everything, as long as they understand to respect it, no problem. Yeah. Well, that really is that really is fantastic, Mike. It really is it's the fact that you give the opportunity to these these young players. You know, during this pandemic, these past couple of years, almost two years, it's been kind of crazy. How have you balanced, you know? teaching and or performing and just keeping your your spirits up in these past uh doing this past challenge well yeah i mean it's like test after test so if we just use the grandscape of music for me as a journey when i started music was a beautiful chariot with four horses and roman gladiators riding into the sunset to go play your local legion you know, they were so valued. There was like town parades for the musicians. Wow, you're a musician. Oh, you come play my play on this party. It's going to be great. People were adored. And then in the mid 80s, drinking and driving became a reality where, whoa, all you guys are drinking and driving. No, we're not doing that anymore. So then that kind of went down to, let's say, one horse on the chariot. And then DJs came. And I'm not saying DJs are bad, but also I'm not saying DJs are great for us musicians because they bring a perfection that real music doesn't attain. There is no perfection in real music. There's humanity. So that changed the chariot. The chariot changed to what I consider the donkey. So once you added the other competitions or productions, musicians were riding a donkey. And the donkey analogy would be you have a stick with a beautiful bag of carrots. There was still a bag of carrots in the, you know, let's say the late 80s, early 90s. And then that carrot changed to one singular carrot in the, in the later 2000s, or say into the 2000s. But then in the 2000s leading into the later, I think the carrot fell off and we all pretended like it was still there. Ah, we're still doing music, we love our life, but we're just chasing the stick. Well, I think, I think now the donkey is being poisoned. <laughs> so now I'm like riding a poisoned donkey with no carrot. And that seems to be the direction of live music right now. So I am not really trying to invest too much into live music right now. I want it and I love it, but it has to be inclusive. That's what music is for me. That's what it should be for everyone. So uh, regardless of any stances and opinions, I just think if music's not bringing people together, then I don't want to be there. So I don't want to be at a venue where the doorman is 
making sure everything's this and nobody can dance and no, you can't go to the table and say hi to the people that drove two hours to see you. I'm not into that. And um, for, unfortunately, I don't really do a lot of big cedar venues. So, um, I mean, I've done them and I will do them, but I don't do a lot of them. So I'm not really used to not being too close to my friends and fans. And I'm not too, too comfortable not going out and saying, hi, Dom, sitting at your table. So um, right now in the last two years, I've maybe done 10 shows and they've been good, but not great. You know, it's, it's a feeling and I want that give and take from shows. Uh, now to segue into like my pride of a teacher, let's, uh, let's say I play a local venue next to you and I've tuned my drums for four hours and I brought you these special symbols and I played those songs till they're perfect. There's some guy watching UFC. There's somebody over there drinking and being too loud. Somebody showed up to start a fight. They're not really there for us. So I don't really feel appreciated the way I do when I teach. When somebody comes to me for a lesson, all of the details are measured and exposed that, hey, uh, what's this pedal? Oh, how much is this pedal? What? That pedal's this expensive? And you have it set this way? So I get to really divulge the hard work. And then they try it. And I'm like, OK, stick control, page seven. Here you go. 80 beats per minute. Oh, I can do this. OK, 100 beats per minute. Whoa. And then they see that, well, Mike, you can do it at 240 beats per minute. They understand instantly how much work and time that is. But when I put that into a song, nobody understands. And if they do, it just, right? So for me, becoming a teacher has been a lot more valuable lately. And it's been a real neat segue to feel valued. And um, yeah, I would say during the pandemic side of things, though, the students have saved my life as far as enthusiasm and encouragement. Because without the students, I probably, I probably would have been too negative about the loss. But the students, they bring hope, they bring potential, they remind you that there's a whole thing to look forward to. And um, yeah, every day I have a list, you know, it's like Santa Claus's list, like, oh, today I get to see Jimmy, Bobby, Sally, Sarah. And I'm like, oh, yeah, versus the you don't have a gig tomorrow, you don't have a gig next week, you don't have a gig, you're not going to PASIC to hang out with Dom, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and uh, Boo McAfee says hello, by the way. Oh, good. Send them my best for sure. Yeah, he told me he saw you at PASIC and it was great to see you. Oh, yeah, jealous! I was I was in and out of pacing. It was just so great. But uh, but well, it sounds like you've got a real a real deep philosophy in how you teach and and how you live your life. And it sounds like you really are incredibly dedicated to the art form. And you know, you go back to the history of of Sabian, and of course with Andy, who as president now is continuing in his father's legacy of supporting education, which is very powerful. Yeah, I, you know, hats off to Andy hugely. When I met Andy at NAMM, uh, I bought him a drink because I wanted him to know instantly he had my respect. There was no, <clears throat> you're not your dad. There's none of that for me because, you know, he's doing such a great service as one of the family members. He's the Ann of Sabian. And the new logo, I love it. I'm a huge fan of it. And Andy, if you're listening, <laughs> you want to pay for that tattoo, we could do it. <laughs> um, I love the new logo because it represents the changing of the guard almost in the same way it represented Sabian's creation from the old team. And, um, and you know, when you see the HHX complex come out and you, they hear it, you can't deny that Sabian is still amazingly healthy and it is still innovating and still providing for us artists. Uh, another aspect of Sabian is the signature signature line is the fact that they really do listen to us, the players, the you know, the meatheads like myself that just practice into oblivion, they take the time to listen to us, uh, especially Mark. You know, I think Mark is a huge spice for Sabian. But uh, yeah, I respect Sabian hugely. I'm so proud to represent them. And I hope they're just as proud for me to represent them. And yeah, it's, it's a phenomenal situation. It's family, you know, not too often you feel that with a company because it's a company with people. But I don't think Sabian's much of a company to me. It's just a family. It really is. It's a great observation, Mike, because it really has been that way uh, in the over 30 years that I've been involved with the company. And uh, I go back to the early days in the beginning of Sabian and, and just the growth and to see it change and develop and become what it is, is a legacy that we're all a part of. Is and there a Dom Familero sim symbol out there? Not not yet, but uh, but who knows what the future will entail for sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, for sure. And I'm sure you have ideas and I'm sure they've heard your ideas and yeah. It really is. Well, there's so many, listen, I'm, I, no matter what I play, that I play at Sabian, I love all of what they do, whether it's the AAX line or the AA line or the HH or the HHX, the Evolution series that Weka put together, his Legacy series that Weka put together, of course, the Radius stuff that Bozio did, and of course, Neil Peart's Paragon line. 
There's so many great stuff, the Garibaldi stuff, the Todd Zuckerman stuff. There's just so many great sounds out there that just allows us to open up our mind and open up our level of creativity. That's really kind of what Sabian stands for. But I want everyone to go to your website, MikeMachine.com. Everyone go there and check it out and uh, and contact Mike if anybody's interested in any lessons or any time with Mike. Email yeah. him through his website for sure and contact him. He'll be open to share you with any of his ideas, and I think that would be pretty fantastic. Yeah, I would love that. Um, I still have a lot of slots in the daytime that might work for somebody in Brazil more than somebody in BC. So I would love that. Please contact me for sure. That's the key thing. And globally, you know, listen, globally, we're reaching the world globally. Here we are now, you know, going through Facebook and 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 YouTube channel. This is powerful that we have all these people globally that have joined us. When I look back at the at just the the list and the comments, my gosh, I, I, there are tons of people here that have joined us from all around the world. I mean, I get a kick out of this here. Um, uh, Benjamin, uh, yeah, Mike, great story with Neil Peart. Greetings here. Look at this here. Greetings from El Salvador. Nice, yeah. So I met Benjamin at NAM as well. He's a fellow Yamaha uh, hybrid artist, and he's a great drummer and a great guy. Nice. Thanks. Thanks, Ben. Oh, this is incredible. Check this out. Oh, love from Newfoundland. Oh, man. You're, you're, listen, you're reaching all throughout about the area. <laughs> this, this, this is, this no, is... I'm like an infamous. I'm not so famous as infamous. <laughs> <laughs> this is, look at this here. This is Artemy Kor, who's a phenomenal drummer and teacher from Moscow. So you've got nice. some people that are joining us from all around the world. Here's Hannah Anderson, who's from Denmark, and she's a phenomenal player. I've actually had her and interviewed her here. So just great right. stuff. So you've reached the world here, Mike. You really have yeah. done that. You've reached the world. You've got people that are inspired on what you're doing. Again, everybody go to MikeMachine.com. I want to thank everybody at the Saving Education Network, Joe Bergamini, who is the manager of this program, who's doing a phenomenal job connecting us all together and making it happen and keeping us going on by having these interviews in a couple of weeks. I'm going to be interviewing some more people. I'm going to have Emmanuel Caplet. Yeah, you have another Canadian. Another Canadian here. Going to bring her on and talk about her new book that she put out, what it is. So, Mike, thank you so much for being here. I'm impressed with what you're doing. I'm inspired by what you're doing. And on behalf of Sabian and the Sabian Education Network, we thank you so much. Keep going. Keep me posted. And anyway, I can help you out. You know I'm a phone call away. Awesome. Thanks so much, everybody. Thanks, Sabian. Thanks so much, Mike. Thanks, Mom. <laughs>